Good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us here at Carnegie's uh, uh, beautiful uh, headquarters uh, building. My name is Rick Carlson. I'm the director of the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism, which is one of the two uh, research departments that Carnegie runs in uh, Upper Northwest Washington. Uh, we as humans have always been at the mercy of our planet's restlessness. Volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, and other natural phenomena result in full-blown disasters. The Alaska earthquake only last week uh, is the most recent example of damage that can be caused when the solid earth becomes not so solid. Uh, until recently, uh, people could respond to natural disasters only after they occurred. Uh, but with increasing understanding of nature and with the help of science and technology, it's now possible to prepare for disasters before they happen. Understanding disasters and helping people prepare for them has been uh, the focus of Dr. Lucy Jones' uh, entire career. After spending more than three decades studying earthquakes at the United States Geological Survey, she left federal service in 2016 uh, to found the Dr. Lucy Jones Center for Science and Society in Burbank, California. As the center's chief scientist, Dr. Jones brings her considerable experience uh, to help communities adapt and become resilient to changing natural phenomena in the world around them. After receiving her PhD in geophysics from MIT, Dr. Jo uh, Jones uh, joined the Jones joined, excuse me, <laughs> Jones joined, I, I, I should watch that when I'm writing these. Dr. Jones joined the USGS in 1983, uh, where she created methods for assessing earthquake probabilities, and where she developed the first major American earthquake drill. Uh, the Great Shakeout, as it was called, has since expanded around the globe. She's also led uh, the creation of a national science strategy for all of the natural hazards studied by the USGS, uh, which involved promoting the agency's science and encouraging communication, uh, both with the pu public, but also with policymakers. And th this all to prepare uh, the nation for uh, better uh, response to natural disasters. Uh, Dr. Jones has served in several seismic uh, councils and commissions in California. She was, uh, from 2014 to 2018, uh, a member of the Resilient America Roundtable of the National Research Council. She's also a research associate at Caltech Seismological Laboratory, uh, which she's held a uh, position she's held since 1984. Her pioneering science and tireless service have been recognized with, with many awards, including the Samuel, Samuel J. Heyman Service to America Medal, uh, the Ambassador Award of the American Geophysical Union, and the Distinguished Lecture Award of the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute. She's written numerous scientific papers and just recently published a book uh, called The Big Ones, How Natural Desires, Disasters Have Shaped Us and What We Can Do About Them. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Dr. Lucy Jones. Thank you. Well, thank you all and, and thank you for having me here. Um, I'm going to be talking, obviously, about natural disasters, partly as a scientist, but also from a more societal perspective, because I really believe that we need to integrate uh, beyond the science, through the social science, into policy, if we're going to learn how to live with what's coming in our future. I want to start from the position of reminding you that natural hazards are natural. They are an inevitable part of the process that leads to the earth that we live in. I mean, we often put our homes near rivers to be able to have the water for our, our crops and the, the transportation. But anytime you have a river like this, at some point you have a river like this. And it's an inevitable part of having that water that's required, of course, for human life. And it's not just floods that go this way. You might ask, why do you live near a volcano? The answer is volcanoes make for really wonderful cropland. It's very rich soil, well-drained, and uh, historically they have been some of the most productive farms anywhere in the world. Uh, Earthquakes also you th might think is random, but in fact, it's the San Andreas Fault separating from the Hayward Fault that gives us San Francisco Bay. And in general, faults create structures that make it easier to have life. I mean, in Iran, uh, the faults are traps for groundwater. The springs are preferentially distributed down the faults, and it means that all of the communities are preferentially sitting on the faults. So everywhere we go, we have these natural processes that are part of what creates the uh, um, the land that we can live in. And they are driven in cycles that are fundamentally about heat. This is probably some version of this slide is something you all have seen, you know, it shows up in elementary school and high school and over and over again, the water cycle. It's heat that's driving it, 
that gets us to go, oh, that's, well, I was, okay. Let me see, there we go. Uh, you know, the water gets evaporated, the heat process leads to a release of energy. The thing is, the physical, the geophysical phenomena also are driven by heat, just on a longer time scale. So when you have the hot magma coming up at our mid-ocean ridges and transferring out, and the colder rock going back down in the subduction zones, we're accomplishing the same redistribution of heat that goes on in the water cycle. The point of this is, is that we know where our disasters are going to happen. The disasters are spatially predictable, right? So this is the National Seismic Hazard Map created by the USGS for earthquake risk. And the primary distribution of the earthquake risk is here on the west coast where we have a plate boundary. We know where the earthquakes are most likely. We also see other distributions of them. So you may all remember the Mineral Virginia earthquake in 2011. This map was created before that. Uh, and I would point out right here, this extra little blob, this was recognized as an area of extra risk. So when you had the earthquake come through, damage the National Cathedral, uh, it wasn't a complete surprise. There was an earthquake at a very close location back in the 19th century. It just means that you have them a lot less often than those of us who live in places like California and Alaska. Right? And while you do indeed have an earthquake risk, you really probably shouldn't spend, it wouldn't be very cost effective to spend a lot of time in Washington thinking about the earthquakes and ignoring the hurricanes, right? Uh, and when we look at what disasters can do, in fact, hurricanes are often our costliest disasters. Uh, I have here the risks. I mean, these are all in 2018 dollars, so we have accounted for uh, inflation. San Francisco in 1906 practically destroyed the city, but the city wasn't that large then. We do think that you know, newer earthquakes will get a lot more uh, damaging than that, but our relatively frequent hurricanes are causing really high levels of disaster or high levels of damage, because especially when they come in to where people are. I want to remind you, when you think about hurricanes and those risks, what is needed to create a hurricane, uh, the fundamental issue is you need to have hot water when the ocean water is above 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and you need to be able to add a spin so you need to be some distance from the equator so you have your Coriolis force. And you need to not have wind shear that will actually cut it off as it's starting to form. I'm not going to try to do more details than that. I am not a meteorologist. However, uh, it is important to look at what these risks are. And here's a path of where all of the uh, tracks and intensities of the very tropical storms over the last several decades. Notice the gap here at the equator. Right? You need to be far enough from the equator to get the spin for these able to be started. And then the ability to travel north and the path that they take is going to depend upon the temperature of the water. So here in Washington, D.C., we have some risk of hurricanes, not as much as Florida. And I will just say, so what? Right? Yes, Florida has a bigger risk, and that might be an important thing to think about as a national distribution of resources, but it doesn't mean you don't have a risk, it just means you get them a little less often. And of course, uh, with what's likely to be coming, you're likely to be getting them more often, since the most important thing is how hot the water is. As the water gets hotter, the hurricanes can go farther north. There's still a lot of debate about what causes the initiation of a hurricane. Still some argument about the degree to which the number will be increasing, but no argument about the ability of hurricanes to go farther north and to stay stronger as they go farther north, just because the water is heating up. Here's our basic temperature data. And I'll just take one moment if you, you know, any question about why this might be happening, you look at the CO2 distribution for the last half a million years, what we are doing in the human record is not natural. And when you calculate what that should be giving us, along with what volcanoes, because volcanoes do often produce both CO2 that can increase the temperature, they also produce various aerosols that can decrease the temperature. You put them together, uh, the rate at which our, we're warming up is pretty well predicted by what we're doing to the carbon dioxide. Okay, 
So you have hurricanes, you've got a significant risk, you're gonna have various other types of flooding risks. What do you do about it? I told you where, now most people wanna say when. What should be the distribution of events? We instinctively tend to assume that our distribution of events looks something like this. This is what happens, you get a normal distribution when you have a prediction of a storm, right? There's supposed to be a storm coming in on Sunday, and we have a prediction of snow. Well, it might travel a little faster than we think and come earlier, or a little slower than we think and come later. And of course, maybe the track will disappear and we won't get the, earth, the, the snow event at all. Right? Uh, and so this is a sort of distribution, temporal distribution that we're comfortable with. It makes sense to us to think of, of, of our disasters coming this way. And a lot of people want the earthquake to happen this way too, right? You build up the strength on the fault and you stress on the fault until the fault moves. And so it's most likely to be sometime in the future and it might come a bit earlier or maybe it'll really hold on, it'll come a bit later, but we expect some sort of distribution like this. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, we could have some completely uniform distribution. That's not a very common thing in the world, to, in the natural world, to find something actually uniform. But we could have a memoryless distribution, a random distribution, that the time to the next event is independent of what came before. And then you actually expect a distribution of intervals something like this. On earthquakes, of course, on, on hurricanes, we sort of know we got to probably have an increased risk because of climate change, but which year it's going to show up in, we do know that that's not really predictable. We don't know which year is going to come along and have this. It turns out that on earthquakes, it's pretty much the same thing. This is data from the one place on the San Andreas Fault where we actually have 11 intervals that we can get between big earthquakes. Uh, we have three of them that are less than 50 years and one that's more than 300 years. And we can say the average time between earthquakes is 100 years, but just, it's, you know, this is, with a limited amount of data, the best fit is a random distribution that every year has a random 1% chance of having the earthquake. And the fact that it's already been 160 years since the last earthquake at that location just puts us out here. Right? Does that tell us when the next earthquake's going to be? No, it doesn't. Right? And uh, the best, our, uh, as I said, the best fit to the data is that it's random. And we hate it. <laughs> random makes people really upset. Right? Because that means that every time is just as scary as any other. How do you make yourself safe when you have no idea of when it's coming? And in fact, if we look back at how humans face this thing, and when I say back, I mean really back, think about how we evolved out on the African savanna, and we were faced with predators, with, with stronger muscles, with bigger teeth. We were able to defend ourselves with our brains. We were able to make the pattern that associated the waving grass with a hidden predator, and use it to make ourselves safe. So we are literally evolved to find patterns, especially when faced with danger. This has been a very useful uh, feature in human development, when we could go and correlate the mushrooms we ate with the gastrointestinal distress that we suffered, we did a better job of surviving. So the, the Proto-humans that were our ancestors were the ones that survived, the ones who used their brains to make patterns and say, no, this isn't random, I can make an association and see, be safe because of it. The problem is, we find the patterns even when they don't exist, right? <laughs> so we do a really good job of this. And in early, you know, as we faced disasters, how come my town, got, my generation, got hit by an earthquake or the uh, volcano erupted, and not the previous generation or next generation? We needed to find a pattern, and we tended to put it into the sky, into the gods, because that was a place that you couldn't test and show that the pattern was wrong. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the word disaster itself, it actually uh, shows up in the time of Shakespeare, it comes from the word ill-starred. 
It is, reflects the belief that the reason the disaster hit was because fate was held against you. Uh, and if you go back to the earlier, you know, earliest development in, in European society and the Roman tradition, the pagan tradition, the disasters happened because you got in the way of fighting gods. I mean, the original, you know, that the volcano would erupt because Venus had cheated on Vulcan and he was having a male hissy fit again, and you just happened to get in the way. Right? And, um, you know, that probably fits with what the experience of life was like for a Roman peasant. You got in the way of those powerful people, you got hit. Right? So it fit within their life experience. Um, of course, Mount Vesuvius did erupt rather famously in AD 79 in what we call a Plinian eruption, which means this type of, of, of towering smoke cloud that then expands out. Um, this isn't actually a picture of Mount Vesuvius, this is from Alaska. Um, but it's a great description of a Plinian eruption, which is, it's called a Plinian eruption because Pliny the, the Younger was uh, living with his uncle Pliny the Elder, who was the uh, admiral of the, the fleet in the Bay of Naples when the eruption happened. And he documented this, and his letters came down to us. And we know that what happened in that eruption was it began with the, the, the Plinian, uh, the, the towering smoke cloud. It then went all dark. Um, many people ran away. In fact, in Pliny the Younger's um, letters, he describes trying to make his way out of Naples or out of the, um, uh, where was he, in Mycenae, um, uh, back towards Rome and helping his elderly mother get through there. And he even said, it was through utter blackness. And he said, I was sure that the world, that I was going to die, but I took a small comfort in knowing that the world was ending with me. Um, <laughs> And of course, he didn't die, he made it to Rome. He was able to, to write this all down later. Um, but there were some people who said, you know, maybe this isn't such a hot idea going out. There's rocks falling on your head. I'm going to stay here and stay sheltered uh, in Pompeii. The problem, of course, was that it turned from being a Plinian eruption into what's called a pyroclastic flow. Again, not Mount Vesuvius. This picture's from Mount Pinatubo in, in the Philippines, but it's an amazing picture of what's called a, a pyroclastic flow. As the gases are heavy and they've lost the explosive power at the beginning, they start falling down. And so this cloud coming at you is volcanic ash and superheated gases at temperatures of several hundred degrees C. This, we think, can rolling into Pompeii, uh, and of course, the, the famous pictures of the victims in Pompeii where they were, were frozen in place. Um, actually, what uh, the analysis suggests is that they got hit by this pyroclastic flow, uh, were killed immediately because of the superheated uh, temperatures, and then the, the, the contortion of the bodies were actually the, the post-death um, uh, contractions faced with this huge heat. Um, but by an analysis of the records of the number of victims in Pompeii and the tax records and what the, the population was in the region, we actually been able to estimate that about 90% of the people lived. So even though our image is, is everybody buried in place, in fact, most people got out. And I wanted to start there because that's one of the important lessers. You're probably gonna live through whatever the disaster is. Emotionally, with that randomness, we are really afraid of dying. And we have this huge image of the shared deaths, the fact that they happen at the same time, make them more important, right? I mean, people are really worried about dying in earthquakes in LA. You are far more likely, like hundreds of times more likely to die on the freeway. Uh, but it doesn't get us to stop driving. And your roads seem to be just as bad here, I must say. <laughs> just, I know bad traffic, and you guys are impressive, okay. Um, and in fact, it's by far more dangerous to us, right? But it doesn't have the emotional impact of the shared deaths happening at the all time. And so as we look forward, I want to focus on this. You're probably going to live through it, and it shouldn't be about dying. When you think about surviving the disaster, it's how do we live afterwards. Mm -hmm. So the, the Roman uh, expression was, you just got in the way of some pretty angry gods. Uh, at the same time, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, they rejected the idea. They said, no, God is not capricious. God isn't just going to go and you know, hurt you because you got in the way. 
So if you're hurt in a disaster, it must be your fault, right? If God is someone good that you can make a covenant with, there has to be a reason. And so all through the Judeo-Christian tradition is this idea that disasters are God's punishment because we didn't, uh, because we did something wrong. Uh, you know, every culture in the world has a flood story. It's only in the, in the, the Judeo-Christian tradition that it's the victim's fault uh, that they got hit by all of this. So, and it became a very important, it's a very fundamental part of Western civilization, is that idea that these disasters happen because somebody is at fault. Uh, and it became, it was so much part of the tradition that earthquakes were never studied as a physical phenomenon. And even as you start the development of the Great Enlightenment, it did not, at the beginning, include studies of earthquakes because those were so obviously uh, manifestation of, of, of God's anger. Uh, that's true until the uh, Lisbon earthquake of 1755. So this earthquake uh, was actually probably an 8.7. Many people don't realize that, that Europe has ever had that large an earthquake. It was offshore from Portugal, created a big tsunami. This picture, this is a contemporaneous painting, uh, and that tsunami coming up the river was clearly a large part of the damage that happened. But also, this earthquake happened on All Saints Day at 9.40 in the morning. Now, Portugal at the time was a very Catholic, very devout country. A couple, like over, something like 3% of the population lived in convents or monasteries. Um, the, the Jesuits had complete control of all of the uh, uh, intellectual life. It was in the middle of the Inquisition. Lots of uh, 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 death by burning, uh, you know, uh, going on uh, what they called auto de fe, acts of faith for punishing the, um, the sinners. Uh, and so, this was very much the environment in which it happened, and the earthquake happened at 9.40 in the morning at the height of the mass that most people went to for All Saints Day. Right? And this created a pretty significant uh, theological conundrum. Um, uh, basically, all of the pious were killed in the pews, and then the, the prostitutes were basically spared. The brothels were wood frame buildings up on the, uh, uh, up on the hills, and... Uh, uh, they did fare much better. So it, it you know, caused quite a bit of consternation. Uh, in the intellectual side of things, there were big arguments that got going. So Voltaire famously wrote a poem on the, the, the Lisbon disaster. Just, it was published just a month after the earthquake happened. Uh, and can you then impute a sinful deed to babes who on their mother's bosoms bleed? The idea, you know, how can you say that all of these people were wrong? Uh, What's really interesting is to look at the intellectual argument that developed after this. Vo um, Rousseau argued back that no, this was the fault of people having chose to live in that horrible urban life. And so this, you know, this was the consequence for, for having rejected nature. And actually Rousseau then went on to say, besides, we don't know what worse fate they might have been spared by having died in this earthquake. And you've really got to wonder how bad he thought living in a city was that this was the lesser fate. Um, so there was an intellectual discussion. It actually, at the social level, it was much clearer. Uh, you can find uh, these sermons from the Catholic churches. Clearly, we haven't been fervent enough in our persecution of the Protestants. Let's go be burn some more of them at the stake. Uh, on the Protestant side, it was like, <laughs> what more fa uh, evidence do we need that the Inquisition is the devil's work? Uh, and in fact, uh, rather bitterly, um, uh, the Netherlands, the, the Dutch government was asked for aid for Lisbon, and it was a Calvinist country at that point, and they literally replied, God has decreed how much Lisbon should suffer, and it is not our place to interfere with what God has decreed, and they refused all aid. Now, we can, we can be pretty critical of, of uh, that sort of attitude. In fact, across human society, we find a very similar uh, Rejection of randomness as an explanation. So when the 1923 Kanto earthquake happened in Japan, it was actually literally located under the city of Tokyo and Yokohama. You know, usually faults are shown as a line. That's just, well, often faults are shown as a line, but that's just if they're vertical. Or that's the intersection of the plane of the fault with the plane of the Earth's surface. In this case, it was a sub-horizontal fault that lay underneath both Yokohama and Tokyo. Magnitude 7.9, directly underneath the city. The shaking was devastating. 
60% of the buildings in Tokyo, 80% in Yokohama uh, were destroyed by this earthquake. And it set off fires, horrible fires that went through the city. A total of 140,000 people died in Tokyo, many of them burned to death. Uh, and uh, an anonymous uh, survivor uh, was quoted as saying, if this were not hell, where would hell be? Now, in the Confucian and Asian tradition, it was very easy to explain this. This was because of a yin-yang imbalance. There was a book written actually uh, 200 BC that said that the emperor sits at the interface between the celestial and the mortal realms, and when there is unbalance in the emperor's court, it will be reflected in imbalance within the world. Uh, so if you have too much yin, or if you have too much yang in your system, too much male energy, like if the emperor is too powerful and won't allow the ministers the appropriate role, the yang overpowers the yin, you get hurricanes because the sky is yang and the earth is yin. Too much yin, the earth overpowers the sky and you get earthquakes. So the most obvious reason for an earthquake is that the emperor is about to die because the emperor is the ultimate yang within the government. Um, when this earthquake happened in Japan, of course, it was a time when Japan was starting to move beyond these traditional views, but uh, was still you know, struggling with that place. Uh, and the emperor had been extremely ill. He actually had developed cerebral meningitis as a child, and he had such neurological problems. He had not been seen in public for four years at the time of this earthquake, and his son, Hirohito, was acting as prince regent. And then to compound the issue, the prime minister, which in Japanese tradition, you know, out of the shogun tradition, was a much stronger f uh, figure, the, the prime minister had died of natural causes a week before the earthquake. So there was no prime minister. So even though they were developing, uh, you know, a lot of industrial base and were really moving into the modern world, all of the uh, old traditions pulled them back to saying the cause of this is a failure in government. What happened in the next few days is, is pretty depressing, um, partly in response to the social unrest generated by this and, and the, the fundamental fear that all these people were, were, perceiving, were, were experiencing. Uh, it ended up getting directed against their neighbors and 6,000 Koreans who lived in the, ja in the Tokyo Yamakahama area were slaughtered by their neighbors, about one third of the population, the Korean population, um, in what ended up becoming basically ritual slaughter. There was torture involved and um, uh, at least uh, acquiescence on the part of the government. Um, this is not to say this is the only time this has happened, so I don't want to take this too much against the Japanese. I think this is symptomatic of the human condition and the biggest thing is that our most constant response to disaster is blame. We need to find someone to blame, to find a reason, to form a pattern, to say it's not gonna happen to me. I wanna take us back a moment now to, back to uh, Portugal. Uh, at the time it happened, the Marques de Pombal was the uh, uh, prime minister of, of Portugal uh, and had really taken over the running of government. Officially, the king was an absolute monarch, uh, but he wasn't particularly interested in ruling and the Marques had, uh, uh, was doing much of the work of government. In fact, when the earthquake happened, the king and his family had gone to the early services to be able to go out to their country estate and enjoy the holiday. Um, the Marques was able to get out to the summer palace and meet the king and he was famously, the king was famously quoted as, as turning to, to Pombal when he arrived, what do we do about this divine retribution? And the Marques supposedly replied, sire, we bury the dead and we feed the living which is still probably the most succinct statement of emergency management functions that I've ever heard. Uh, and he set out and he did it. And he did it extraordinarily effectively. Uh, he shut the city gates, kept people from running away so that he would have manpower to help pull things together. Uh, he got the dead, uh, weighted down and thrown to sea because with 20,000 dead in the city, well, 60,000 dead across Portugal, uh, at least half of this in, in, in Lisbon, 
um, they were facing a public health crisis and they had to get the bodies disposed of, and even though it was on the opposition of the church, but they, they got this done. And he moved to rebuild Portugal, and within one month, he had plans for the new Lisbon in front of the king, and arranged to choose from. They ended up choosing a very aggressive rebuilding of Lisbon. Uh, Lisbon is the only uh, major European city that's on a rectilinear scale. That's because it was completely rebuilt after this earthquake in an organized way with wide roads so that they would be able to better fight fires, because uh, fires, again, were one of the, the big issues. He also developed a whole new style of architecture that's called Pombaline in his honor, and it was the first earthquake engineering. They made scale models of the buildings and then had the cavalry ride their horses <laughs> around the buildings to cause them to shake to see where the, uh, uh, the weaknesses would be. And he was incredibly effective at this. And within a year, they were actively rebuilding. Uh, and people appreciated it. People, he got huge political power because he was so effectively responding and giving people hope in this desperate situation. Um, and that's the other lesson I want to come to here. Disaster, what happens in the disaster, it's really about recovery. It's about what happens, not just at the moment, it's how we get out of it. So what do I mean by recovery? Let's look at what we think goes on. This is a, now a little bit of schematic um, um, uh, I, idea sort of graphs. It shouldn't be too challenging here. Uh, on this scale, I want to put basically economic activity, wealth the things that we have that are the resources that we deal with. And we expect that to grow with time, right? In general, if we, if we aren't actually growing our economy, we call it a recession. Maybe it can happen, but uh, right. Um, when the disaster happens, we lose wealth. We have things that are broken by the event, plus, of course, we're shutting down our economic activity. If you've lost your utilities, you aren't running your manufacturing. And so what we need to do as we come out of this is to get it to come back quickly enough that we get back to where we were before. So in a good response to a disaster, you get those the utilities back on, you get the debris removed, you go and hire contractors, and they hire subcontractors to do the rebuilding, and you get your economic activity up and going, and you're back to where you were within a couple of years. Uh, in California, we sometimes call this the Northridge model. Uh, we actually, you can argue that Northridge got us out of a recession. Things were not going real well in, in Los Angeles in 1993. And, uh, but because of all of the money that poured in, we had a very proactive FEMA at the time that sent a lot of money to California. 40% of the homeowners had earthquake insurance and, and went and spent money to rebuild their houses. And we really got it moving again. It doesn't have to go that way. Uh, if you can't get recovery moving, if you can't get the utilities back, you can't get people to come back if they've been evacuated, uh, then you have trouble keeping the, the, economy, uh, the economy moving, and you end up with this uh, much longer time period before you get your economic level back to where it was before. And if you compare the two areas under the curve, you can see that the amount of money lost through a delayed recovery can dwarf what happens in the disaster itself. And in case you don't think that's real, let's look at what's happened in New Orleans. Uh, this is the GDP of New Orleans in Nashville from 2002 to 2012. There were $80 billion in direct losses at the time of Hurricane Katrina in 2005. But if you just say that, that New Orleans should have been able to keep up with Nashville, you get $105 billion in lost GDP in the seven years after the event. And of course, we're doing this in terms of money, but it's also really about people. Here's the population of New Orleans through the same time period. And this is really reflecting that people left and they didn't come back. So what we're talking about when you're in a city faced with a disaster is what's going to happen to our urban society. And what we're trying to do is create an urban disaster resilience, meaning a society that still functions after the earthquake, a place where we can stay. Uh, I say earthquake, I'm doing this in California. Earthquake or hurricane, right? How do we keep things moving here? And when you think, of, what does it mean to have a system, a city working? 
As a scientist or engineer, I would describe a city as a system of systems. When you build a city, you first put in a system of water pipes and sewer pipes. And on top of that system of pipes, we put the houses that we live in, we put the buildings that we work in, we put our power systems, our manufacturing, our transportation systems, our communication systems. And we have a system of systems that's all there in place to keep human life functioning in this urban environment. And to keep it functioning, we have a base set of critical infrastructure. We have our basic utilities of water and power. In a modern society, we need internet and communications, and we need our buildings that we're able to work in. And this is a core set of infrastructure that needs to be functioning to build a city. And on that core system, we can then build all of the other pieces that mean urban life. Mm -hmm. Now, they don't have to keep on working perfectly. We do have resilience. We, ha we have a lot of flexibility in how we do this. For instance, let's imagine that we lose a bunch of buildings, obviously from an earthquake perspective, uh, but we still have internet. Then people who couldn't go to work because those buildings are damaged can still telecommute and still stay in the region and keep on working. And likewise, if we lose water but we have transportation, we can be carting the water in. So when we look at what it means to be facing disasters from a city, we are talking about keeping this overall system functioning well enough that we can manage and get through and mobilize to rebuild. And you know, I, I started by saying the hurricanes are coming farther north, and we really worry with climate change and what's coming in the meteorological disasters. But even without a change in rate of disasters, we are changing our exposure because of the increase in urbanization. If you look at how many people live in cities over time, lost, the United States was actually one of the earlier ones to urbanize, so that by 1900, it was almost 40%. We're now 80% living in cities. Worldwide, we've gone from in the teens to 55% of the human population living in cities. The expectation for the world is that by 2050, we're going to be more than two-thirds of the world's population living in cities. And that means we are increasingly vulnerable to the disruption of human systems when we have a disaster coming into one of our major cities. So what can we do about it? Let's go back and look at this issue. How do we make sure that we're following the recovery curve and not the catastrophe curve. Probably the most fundamental thing is making sure the damage doesn't happen in the first place. All right? uh, mitigation, preventing the damage by re we will reduce the amount that this comes down, reduces the need for response, and increases the likelihood that we're going to be able to get back up. And fundamentally, almost all, well, not all, but much of the damage from natural disasters is preventable, depending on how much money we're willing to spend. You know, uh, you know the earthquake happened in Alaska last, last week, uh, and there are essentially no damage to buildings, even though they had a magnitude 7 right under the city of Anchorage. And there's two reasons behind that. One is they had a big earthquake in 1964 with even more shaking than what they got from this event. That was a 9.2. Farther away, it was offshore, but it caused more shaking than this seven. So the old bad buildings had already been taken out. Right? But in addition, the buildings built since then are built to withstand the nine. And therefore, when they got the seven with less shaking, they did extremely well. But we have not yet, as a society, really grappled with what these issues are. Because we say that if you choose to build such a weak building, that it's a total financial loss after the disaster, that is your financial choice to make. And the only role of government is to make sure you don't kill somebody in the process. So our building codes for earthquakes, for hurricanes, for strong winds, are all aimed that it, 
what's a reasonable worst case, not absolute worst case, just what has a 10% chance of happening in 50 years, the type of event you'd get once every 500 years, you should make sure you don't kill anybody. But a total financial loss, hey, that's your problem. Right? Uh, and what Alaska shows us is if we were willing to build a bit stronger, we can have no financial losses. You know, Christchurch, New Zealand had their design earthquake, did what the, in, in 2011, and no modern building collapsed. The building code did exactly what it was supposed to, and they have had to tear down 1,800 buildings and rebuild the city. Okay. So that is what we are intentionally putting into our cities, is huge economic losses, just making sure we don't kill people. Because emotionally, we're afraid of dying, and we aren't really grappling with what the economic issues are. Sorry, that get off my high horse now. Go back to the, the talk. Um, in terms of sp the other really big thing that we can do in speeding up recovery is improved planning. You know, I, Dwight Eisenhower famously said that plans are useless, but planning is essential. Um, and the whole process of trying to plan and think what you've got through uh, really does make a difference in our ability to respond. And I would just hope as we do this that we more often see not only plan for whatever, but then recognize what part of it we can prevent. Because um, I guess I didn't give you the punchline. If we were to build the buildings 50% stronger in California than what is needed to, to, to not kill people, for 1% the cost of construction, we could add 50% to the strength of the buildings and basically eliminate most of that financial disruption. Uh, but we've got to choose to do it and say it's worthwhile. Right? Um, so, if we want to say, how do we speed up recovery, what do we do about it? Right? I'll tell you, I, as you heard, I, I left federal government to create a nonprofit, and this was partly because in a research science organization, I need to do research science. And if I left, there's lots of brilliant young scientists that have come in to take those jobs who are doing a wonderful job of research. But Congress doesn't pay the USGS to help people understand the science. And I started realizing the decisions were not happening because of that. And I spent the year of 2014 while I was at the USGS with the mayor of Los Angeles and ended up coming up with the biggest uh, increase in seismic safety, a whole suite of, of proposals that have all been going through. It's astonishing how the change is happening, that when people understand the science and understand the consequences, they can make a cho choice to go forward. And by leaving the USGS and forming the nonprofit, I am now able to help other governments that are working on this. They're following the example of, of the city of Los Angeles. And we actually have 12 more cities in Southern California that are now preparing uh, seismic retrofitting legislation, mandating people fix up their, their bad buildings. Uh, and it's a very exciting time as we watch the change happen. I'm also trying to work with community organizations because it's communities that matter. And I think perhaps most importantly is trying to help scientists understand what it takes to communicate with policymakers. You know, we are famously, we sit in our ivory towers and it's a lot of fun to sit and do my own research. And, you know, when the research is done and we've really solved the problem, we get bored, right? Solved problem, let's go on to something new. And yet, uh, figuring out how to complete that process and get it understand is really important. And I'm now undertaking a partnership with Caltech to uh, start training some of the students in, in, that are interested in this about ways to work with policymakers. And uh, I also want to reach out and start working with some of the issues about climate change because I see it as being uh, such an important issue and how much... How much could potentially be coming at us through disasters? Because that's going to be one of the mechanisms by which the changes happen. Uh, I want to also look at a, one more, a couple of more disasters to take a couple of more lessons and to think of in this question of what can we do as individuals, as communities to try and make a difference. 
You know, in, in uh, 1783, there was an eruption in Iceland that is probably the most catastrophic disaster in human history. Uh, the gases from this eruption got up into the stratosphere, really uh, cooled off the earth, uh, led to the uh, turned off the monsoons because the continents weren't heating, led to famines in Egypt and uh, India and Japan, uh, huge disasters across uh, Europe as well. So it was, it was a catastrophic event across the world. In Iceland, this is actually the Lockheed craters. They, the eruption happened down a series of craters. This used to be some of the most fertile farmland of Iceland. And uh, a significant percentage of it was wiped out, was covered in lava in this event. Uh, a quarter of the population of the country died. Uh, and they were very much in risk of the whole uh, the country falling apart. People, you know, do, do you try to leave? Can you make it through? And they survived because of people that cared about their communities. There's a very famous story that's told in Iceland about a guy who was called the fire priest. Uh, Jón Steingrinsson, he was the, the pastor very near where this is happening. And he was called the fire priest because as they, the, uh, lava came through, it was closing in on the community, they were realizing they were going to have to leave, and they had one last service at which he preached a, it sounds like a pretty long sermon, uh, about trusting in God and whatever comes, we're just going to have to deal with it, uh, and as he's preaching, the lava stopped flowing towards them. Now, it, it, further analysis, they think that what happened is it hit a river that had enough water that it was able to freeze and create a, a dam to divert the lava uh, before the water in the river had completely evaporated. Um, but he is remembered and he's talked about in schools as the fire priest, the one who stopped the lava in its tracks. Right? Well, actually, one of the, th the other thing that he did is he stayed in that community because the lava covered the fields, but the gases were poisoning people. And the gases were poisoning the crops. And they were, the people didn't die from being hit by lava. They died because all of the, the food on land was poisoned with heavy fluorine concentrations. The only thing that could be eaten was out of the ocean. And he kept his community together. He provided medical care. He went to Reykjavik and got uh, money to, from the Danish government to try and help them. And as they were facing the final level of starvation, led a team down to the ocean where they were actually found a colony of seals that they were able to kill and bring back and have meat to survive the winter. So what he, different, he kept the community together. What really mattered was what he did in recovery. But what he's remembered for is preaching that one sermon because of our emotional connection to the suddenness of that event. Uh, but leave this with this lesson, that what it's people that are really going to determine what happens to us. And what he did was give, give us hope. Um, and for us to go forward, we're gonna have to figure out to change. I keep on saying how that randomness keeps us focused on that moment. If you wanna learn more about it, there's a fantastic book literally called Risk Perception by Paul Slovak about how people look at risk, right? And there's a lot of factors back to that hidden predator that we talked about before. It means that we're more afraid of risks that are unseen that people feel are unknowable, that are uncertain in time, because those all triggers our fear, trigger our fears of those hidden predators. And we need to somehow be able to overcome this, and instead of waiting till the disaster happens and figuring out how we're gonna respond, we need to grasp it now and understand that it's coming for us, not focus on the time, figure out how we're going forward. And we have changed our attitudes before. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about the 1927 Mississippi floods, right? Uh, another great book, by the way, Rising Tide, if you want to really get the details about this one. Uh, this flood event began really in the fall of, of 1926, spread through the whole Mississippi system. There was widespread flooding in 10 different states. Uh, the worst, however, was down here in the Mississippi Delta region, uh, where uh, hundreds of thousands of people were flooded out. 
The total across over a million people lost their homes in the, the floods along the various parts of the river. But it was worse down here where life already depended on the levees. Now the whole Mississippi Delta region, the, delta, the levees were an important part of being able to protect the region. As the flooding came through and uh, uh, the levees were being threatened, they actually went and uh, the Plantation owners sent their workers over to work on the levees. When this wasn't enough, they literally went with uh, um, uh, guns through the African-American community and ordered out the men at gunpoint to come out and work on the levees and try to rebuild them. Uh, when it finally broke in what's called the Mounds Landing Break, um, Several hundred African Americans were swept to their death. They had tried to leave and were forced back at gunpoint. Uh, the American Red Cross reported it as too dead because they didn't bother to count the African Americans. Uh, after the event, then the, the remaining levees are the highest points in town, and people were stranded on the levees as the only place they could stay above the water. Um, they called for help and boats came and when the boats came they took the white families and left the African Americans behind because uh, they were afraid if they, they left the region they'd never come back. Um, the response to this uh, flood is a really interesting look at how Americans have shifted in their response to disasters. At the time it happened, uh, Calvin Coolidge was president and he was adamant that it was immoral to take money collected from everyone and give it to the few so that there would be no aid given to the individuals who were hurt by this disaster. Uh, and uh, that, you know, they, they should rebuild the public works, uh, but they turned to the Red Cross for all of the, the aid. Uh, and he absolutely refused to, 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 to put in um, government funds. This became untenable when it got over a million people that had been hit with the, uh, by the flood, and they ended up turning to his Secretary of Commerce, who was Herbert Hoover, to, to lead the response. Now again, the government did not put in the money. The money came through the Red Cross. Herbert Hoover went out and raised funds for the Red Cross. It was all done through charitable donations to set up the refugee camps. He became a hero. He became he, the, Herbert Hoover, the humanitarian. He, and he um, got out there, got it done, and got great public visibility because of it. Before it happened, he was not a serious presidential contender. Because he handled it well, he started getting talked about as presidential material. The problem was that while he was handling the response very well and handing it to the Red Cross, the Red Cross was continuing to treat the African Americans somewhat differently. The refugee camps were segregated. The better food, the better everything went to the white camps. Uh, and there was serious abuse going on for the um, African Americans. In fact, there, this started to be talked about. It started to make the news. Uh, Herbert Hoover ended up getting an arrangement with the Tuskegee Institute, and there was what was called the Colored Commission to evaluate what was going on in the camps. And they, in fact, documented pretty serious abuses, but then they gave the report to Herbert Hoover and allowed him to decide what to do about it. And they negotiated an agreement, basically. basically Hoover said, look, at, if I become president, you're going to have unprecedented access to the White House. I'm going to try and get rid of the Jim Crow laws. Uh, why don't we keep this quiet? And Tuskegee agreed with them, uh, and they supported his presidential bid. He, of course, became president. Um, but uh, um, the real problems didn't disappear, and it started spreading, it spread more and more through the African American community. Uh, up until this point, no Democrat had ever gotten any significant percentage of the African American vote. Uh, Herbert Hoover lost 15%, which was by, you know, compared to like 1 or 2%, having been the biggest before then. Um, by 1936, uh, uh, Roosevelt, well, by 1932, Roosevelt got the majority of the uh, African American vote, and basically they haven't gone back to the Republican Party since then. Uh, which is to say, 
Disaster response has huge political connotations in both directions. You blow it at the one time that everyone wants their government to be competent, people start questioning your competence elsewhere. If you handle it well, you are given accolades in a lot of different directions. But we shifted because of this from a commitment to not giving any aid to individuals to being able to give support, you know, and we ended up with FEMA being formed in the 70s. The problem is, is we now do buy people out. We give them aid after the disaster, but we still leave it as individual economic decisions, whether or not you're going to build in the floodplain, whether or not you're going to build with many of the, the building codes. What, we still say the only role of the building code is to make sure you don't kill people, rather than looking at what the financial implications are. And I think as we go forward, as we are increasingly urbanized, as we have increasingly interdependent on what happens economically during these disasters, we can't keep this up. You know, this year for the first time, more houses, or in 2017, more houses were destroyed by disasters than were built in the United States. We are reaching a point where the disasters are we can't even keep up with what they're doing to us. And we really are going to have to do more planning ahead. And the reality is the science knows. There's a lot of what we can do that predicts what's going to happen. The, the fixes are often extremely cost effective, but we've got to make the choice to do it. I'm going to end, because this is going on for a while, by going to one more disaster, and I, this may seem crazy, but it's actually a very positive place to go. So in, in, in 2011, of course, the Tohoku Magnitude 9 happened off of the, the coast of northeastern Honshu. Uh, this earthquake caused extreme shaking over half of the island. Only 150 people died in the event. They handled the earthquake extremely well because the Japanese building code and the approach, the sort of the culture of how they're built is extremely resilient. Of course, if it had just been the earthquake, it would have been a different situation. The tsunami that was created uh, caused a huge amount of, of damage right along the coast. Uh, and, and this was because, in fact, that the earthquake had more slip than any scientist thought possible before it happened. So this was a bigger tsunami than was expected. The prediction was for five meters. In fact, what they got was 14 meters. Even this would have been easier to recover. About 18,000 people died in the tsunami. But of course, it was the nuclear disaster that got triggered by it that really compounded the problems. And so uh, this is actually a radiation map out of the Fukushima Daiichi power plant and showing the places where radiation exposure uh, exceed any sort of safety levels. Um, so one more lesson here. It's cascading failures that can really magnify the disaster. So when you worry about the hurricane, it's not just the hurricane. It's what's going to get triggered because of it. And that's where the urban environment, the fact that we're all in cities, is increasing the problem. The reason I'm bringing this up, though, is I got to be out there and meet a lot of the people. And I actually found it amazingly encouraging about how people can come together about their communities and how much a commitment to the community can make a difference. I found something called the Camellia Project. This woman is the priestess for this Shinto shrine. The shrine had actually been flooded in the tsunami from the 1960 Chilean earthquake. And because of that, the community had brought the uh, t dismantled the shrine and brought it up the hill and brought it way up above the tsunami level. And when the tsunami happened, uh, this shrine was not hit. Her house was completely destroyed. She lived in temporary housing for the next five years. But they have created something called the Camellia Project to look forward to their, the next generation planting a path of camellias to the place of safety. Because high on the hill had been this plinth that basically said, hey, descendants, come up here, right? Basically, there's gonna be a, there had been a big tsunami in 870, but the memory had been lost. And so what they are trying to do is make a, p a path that their descendants will remember because camellias need to be taken care of. So they, part of the shrine going forward is keeping care of these camellias and remembering why. Um, 
In the city of Otsuchi, this was a horrible place. This is their city hall. Because of the prediction of a five-meter tsunami, they said, hey, we have a six-meter seawall. We're going to stay here and do our planning for how to respond to the earthquake. When the 14-meter tsunami came through, the whole city council was wiped out. This city has had a horrible time trying to recover. They have no one left to interface with the government and the federal government. This is a shrine that's been placed here to remember those who died. I, I met a woman there named Mia Kamatani. Uh, she came in as a disaster uh, psychology nurse, as a psychiatric support uh, for emergency response. She ended up falling in love, marrying a guy, and staying. And they are, they've created this community to how to help the whole community come back, how to be able to build on their strengths and their weaknesses. And you know, she told me, the biggest challenge is how do you recover when everybody's suffering from PTSD? But they're doing it. And they are creating training programs for other cities about how a city can come together. And in Fukushima, you know, they set up refugee housing for people, uh, people that were evacuated from those really heavily contaminated areas. You know, as the disaster grew and people got you know, ordered out and came in here, you know, with just the clothes on their backs. And they were measured for radiation, and some of them had to have the clothes on their backs taken away from them because of the radiation exposure that they were, they were being hit with. But they have been rebuilding and pulling their community back together. And I met one other woman, this is Maki Sahara, who was a housewife taking care of her kid. Oop, what did I do? Ah, there we go, I hit. Um, and they have begun organizing, getting more information. So this big pile of green, this is all the topsoil from every yard, every schoolyard, every park across the city. They took off two inches of the soil and put them in these big containers because there was so much cesium and other radioactive material that it was the only way to reduce the radiation levels. And she fought and got these radiation monitors put in front of them. She fought to get radiation, uh, handheld Geiger counters and a class for kids to teach them how to recognize where's a safe place to play. Imagine having to tell your kid that you gotta play on the concrete and not in the grass because there's too much cesium in the grass. And this is what they're dealing with. She also fought for and got radiation monitors for every one of the city parks so they know when it's okay. And this is sort of the last lesson. What's really at stake is not our individual lives, it's our communities. And our communities are gonna survive because we've made a commitment to deal with it and to do something about it. And I asked Maki when I was leaving, sort of, was there one thing she really wanted to make sure I said to the rest of the world? And she said, I just want to know that in, I want in 20 years to be able to look back and know we did too much to help the children. Because to look back and realize we didn't do enough would be unbearable. And I feel like that about the disasters that we are facing in our future. We can't look back and say we didn't do enough. We can look back and say we did too much. And I'd much rather be in that place because we're all in this together. Thank you. And that turned into an hour, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have some time for questions. There are uh, microphones on each side of the uh, aisles here, so line up behind those and we'll alternate between them over here. Yeah, you, you talked about how we're building buildings just good enough not to fall down, uh, but you talked about the importance of infrastructure, water, power, and so on. All right. How well are we building there? Well, of course, the biggest problem with our infrastructure is mostly we aren't building it now. We built it 50 or 100 years ago. And it's very hard to get incentive to go in and replace water pipes. Nobody can see the water pipes. So it, it tends to be a bigger vulnerability. And, it's, and if, it's, if you, with earthquakes in particular, it's an interesting thing in Alaska. Their buildings are fantastic, but they had enough liquefaction, which is the, the ground literally you know, oozing out from underneath you, and that it really does a number on the infrastructure. And so their, um, their problems are more with the infrastructure than with the buildings, and I think that's because overall, it's hard to make that commitment. That said, I said Los Angeles is undertaking this new effort. A big part of it is a commitment to a future of seismic resilient pipes, 
because damage to our water systems is potentially the single largest failure and you know, economic losses that we faced between business disruption from water and fires. And um, they've made a commitment that all of the major systems and gradually all of the system will be put in with seismic resistant pipes. That's what they are buying from here on out. Even though when they first made that commitment, it was a twice as much, the, the only type of pipe available cost twice as much as the others. Because they stuck to their guns, there are eight new companies that have developed seismic resistant systems. The prices have come down and it's really not increasing the cost. So it's a, it's a huge success story for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, overall, it's one of our biggest problems. Um, just kind of a, following on what you mentioned about infrastructure, I'm thinking of Hurricane Sandy, tale of very different situations. And for instance, in New York, uh, Verizon goes in right afterwards and says, we've got to pardon our fiber optic cables and our communication systems because they can't fail. But then here in the Washington metro area, we had a failure and it wasn't necessarily related to the storm, but it was just they weren't prepared for the capacity of people teleworking. Okay, well, I mean, in general, this again, it's the matter of forward planning. As long as we're doing it by responding to the last disaster, Number one, we solve the problems in the last disaster and not the ones in the next one. Uh, it's like, you know, in California, we've done a really good job on retrofitting our freeway bridges because we lost them so dramatically in previous earthquakes. Uh, but we didn't, we aren't retrofitting any of the non-freeway bridges. Like, anyway. Uh, so we, we, we do have a problem with, uh, if we, as long as we're, you know, we take the disaster and we respond to what happened then. We're never going to be doing the comprehensive planning. The problem is, I, I do really think it requires a shift. That we as Americans are very individual. We're, we believe in our capitalism. We, you know, don't like the idea that we're dependent on others. And this requires admitting that we're depending on others and that we have a shared stake in this infrastructure. And I, I think it's. You know, I think we're going to get there because we're going to have to, and I hope we can do it before it's because some really catastrophic disaster takes us apart. Hi, um, I am a meteorologist, and I know a lot about weather and potential influence of climate change, global warming. Uh, but there's more than to weather than just terrestrial weather. There's a thing called space weather. Oh yeah. You didn't mention that, and that could be one of the worst potential. Uh, Armageddon is possible. It would jeopardize very realistically life as we know it, possibly for years. I've written about this a couple of times in the Washington Post. And I don't know how familiar you are with it, but I, I suggest that the, they begin to look into it because we are not prepared. You've asked, um, how, do we, how do we recover? There is no way to recover for years and years. Very few people would be killed outright unless they happen to be in an airplane, it crashes to the ground. But imagine a society without electricity, transport, everything, modern tech, everything we rely on in terms of modern technology. This is, this is possible. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I am aware of solar weather. When I was uh, doing the long-term science planning for the USGS, we have a geomagnetism program and do all of the terrestrial monitoring. Mm -hmm. So NOAA does the solar part, we do the ground part. I never understood why we're two separate organizations, but that's a different question. Um, and, and it is a very serious issue, the ability of the solar flares to disrupt our electromagnetic system. Uh, there is a solar flare from the, the 19th century that they think, yeah, if, they, if it's were repeated now, it could be, you know, and we're becoming increasingly dependent. Uh, I didn't cover it here because there's no historic disaster, because we didn't really have the, uh, the infrastructure at that point to look at what it is. But I agree that it's a, it's a major issue. And um, again, it, it's a difficult one, though, because we have to see it to believe it. Humans suffer from something called a normalization bias. We think what we've experienced is what there is. And that ability to look beyond our current one to a, a, a farther off one is a challenge, and that's part of this. What I hope to see is a change in how we deal with of all types of disasters. There have been many, many close calls. Excuse me, but uh, can we move on? Thank you. Over here. <clears throat> Well, now that we've entered Armageddon, <laughs> I, I'd like to go with that in a way. Um, 
I detect in your delivery the great concern. So I'm asking you in a percentage way. In other words, say this is 100% life. What level of disruption do you expect in what period of time and what might be the nature of that? Now, I know it, it's a lot of speculation, but right. I'd still like to hear it from you. Okay, I mean, uh, the one thing to be said is that uh, very few disasters really affect the whole world. The, geo, the solar storms have a potential for a different level because of that. And so we can really take, totally take out, I mean, and we have in previous times in human history, um, the Tangshan earthquake in 1976, half, uh, probably close to half the people in the region died and um, essentially the whole thing came apart. Um, but even there in the challenges of, of the Cultural Revolution, China eventually you know, recovered and pulled it back. And I think these individual disasters are not likely to be causing a global collapse. What we are gonna be seeing, like we're seeing the fact that more houses were destroyed in disasters than, than we built, is we're gonna have trouble keeping up with it economically. And I think that um, we need to value <laughs> We need to value the economy and, and say that deaths that happen because of depression after things come apart are important. That people really losing their quality of life is important. Um, and I don't know how to estimate which one's going to come. And, 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 you know, there's a certain amount of it that's random. It's really going to depend on which earthquake happens when, which hurricane comes in where, how many of them we put together, or my personal nightmare getting the earthquake in Southern California when we have our Santa Ana winds. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that would be bad. Okay. Hi, Dr. Jones. Um, I was really impressed by the, the uh, discussion you had around assigning blame and the tendency uh -huh. to assign blame. I wonder if you could talk about that in terms of re like recent American history from Katrina through oh, right. Maria. Uh, Actually, um, at, in, in the process of writing the book, uh, I have a chapter on Katrina, and I found it very hard to write. Um, first, having looked really dug at what happened in 1927, and really the horrible racism that was involved was extremely depressing. And, and then when I went to do Katrina, it seemed like so much of it was the same thing. Um, but I think it's, if you really dig into the news, so I went, so all these stories that happened with Katrina, what parts of it's real? And, um, how, and really digging into the news and the news over time and the FEMA reports and all of the various things, most of what was reported as the breakdown of social order at the time of Katrina is not true. It didn't happen. It was, but you see, if we thought it did, if we could blame the victims, if we could say it's their fault for staying, why didn't they get out? Or their fault, they're clearly pretty bad people, look at what they're doing. Then we could feel like it wasn't gonna happen to us. Because I think when we saw Katrina and we saw Americans stranded on their rooftops, dying in their attics, shoveled into that, that Superdome, and we, didn't think that that could happen in America, and there we were seeing it. And I think that really upset us, and the way we deal with seeing something that awful is to find a pattern that means it's not gonna happen to me. And if we could blame the victims, then we could say, it, I, I, I'm protected because I won't make that stupid decision. And so I think, and, and you know, part of the point of media when they go, you know, it's to make you feel a bit better about yourself. Look at how these awful people are doing, right? That's a pretty common thing in a lot of disaster reporting. And there's a, you know, you're going to watch the news that makes you feel better about yourself, right? So there's all these human, natural human tendencies that really feed in that direction. And, you know, one of the things is if we can just be aware of it. Whenever the next, you know, there's going to be some disaster in the next 10 years. And we're going to see people, pictures of people suffering. And we're going to say, isn't that awful? And we're going to have an instinct, a gut reaction, to look for a way that it was their fault so I know it won't happen to me. And at least if we're aware of that tendency, maybe we can keep ourselves from going too far down that line. 
Uh, thank you for sharing that. If I can uh, take off on that, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of Emerald Planet, Emerald Planet TV, and we're all about best practices and solutions. So in our TV reporting, we want to do the positive things. What would be the three or four things that we should be constantly talking about so that we don't go down this wrong path and we're providing information to councils, state governments, um, you know, the, the central government about what we should be thinking and doing so that we don't keep compounding the, right. the damage and the loss of life. Well, I, I, I'm enough of a scientist to say, you know, there's probably some really good solid data in there that can help you report. Um, and one thing is when you go to talk with a scientist and you're really struggling to get them to say something coherent, because I realize that's sort of a problem with us, uh, the, the tendency is to ask them, what did you learn in the event? Because that gets, we know that gets a scientist talking, right? They get really animated over that. Uh, and the problem with that question is, that means they're gonna focus on the very small amount we didn't know and not talk about the things that weren't a surprise. And uh, uh, if instead we can say, how much of this was expected? You'll get a different answer that will give a different message to people. We could have done something about this. So there's a lot of other things, but that's, uh, I'll start right there. Thank you very much. We're gonna have to draw the uh, discussion to a close, but there, I think you were here first, so let's take one last question. Okay, thank you. You seem to uh, imply that we should have like stricter building codes and so on. How do you, what's your feeling about these people who live on these islands that have already been flooded out and they know the sea level is rising? Should they, you know, what's your thought on them building? All right, well, that's a pretty generalized question. Uh, and the reality is, is coming in from the outside and saying what you should be doing probably won't be listened to. But I think that, <laughs> One of the things they can do is engage them in the discussion and instead our instinct, we will rebuild. We can't keep on going there. We, and this is part of that bigger picture. How do we plan ahead? We know where the problems are gonna be. So, you know, and one of the things I discovered in working with LA, instead of saying, you should retrofit your building, I came in and said, here's all the things that are gonna get destroyed. What do you think we should do about it? And then when you really have to talk it through, we ended up getting the Building Owners and Management Association standing with the mayor and supporting mandatory retrofit that was gonna cost them a billion dollars. So I think that, yes, we have to deal with it, but we need to deal with it in a somewhat more holistic manner and really engaging the community and finding a joint solution. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> that goes so, so before we depart, uh, I'd like to bring to your attention uh, a special event that's happening next week. Uh, you will be impacted by it because the American Geophysical Union is having its fall meeting in, wa in Washington. Uh, there will be 26,000 geophysicists wa wandering the streets of Washington. Including me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the Carnegie Institution has, has a long history of working with the American Geophysical Union. In fact, our, my, the direct, my first director of my department was the first president of the American Geophysical Union when it formed. Uh, so we have this long relationship and we're gonna honor that relationship next week with a presentation uh, having to do with habitability, what Earth and the inner planets can teach us about the search for life on rocky uh, exoplanets. The discussion will be led by uh, a recent uh, MacArthur uh, fellow, uh, and I'm happy to say as one of our postdocs, uh, Dr. Sarah Stewart. It will be joined by uh, Dr. Peter Driscoll from my laboratory and Dr. Uh, Laura Schaefer from the Arizona State University uh, that will be looking at uh, what are the conditions necessary to uh, support life, uh, the development of life on planets, and sustain it uh, into the future and where we might uh, go to look for it. So I encourage you to uh, register with that event and to come and, and join us again. Uh, after that, I'd like to thank you all for attending uh, and I'll encourage you to look forward to... Uh, There, there's no date. It's December 11th. There's no date on the slide. <laughs> date and time. 6.30, December 11th. Yeah, we, we should do better than this. So, yeah. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>